Black lives matter. All lives matter. Is there room for compromise? As Christians, how should we engage in that conversation? I want to welcome you to our new vlogcast. My name is Hansel Flores. I'm a professor of Old Testament. My co-host is Josh Carmen. You might recognize him from Overtime. What we're doing here is we want to explore how Christians can come to totally opposite conclusions about this. People who love Jesus and love the church and yet disagree on this. So we have two authors here who are going to come to different conclusions about this and we're going to explore their train of thought and their work. So Josh, what do we got? Yeah, our first author that we're looking at today, her name is Dr. Kelly Hamron, and Dr. Kelly uh, is a professor of English at uh, Liberty University. And she wrote this beautiful, beautiful piece uh, talking about a little bit more of the nuances and intricacies of the Black Lives Matter movement uh, and comes to the conclusion of the value of engagement with nuance, right? So uh, there's value in supporting the statement and there might even be some value in participating in aspects of the movement as a whole, but just because you, you, know, you buy some of it doesn't mean you have to buy all of it. Basically, uh, put succinctly, you can walk and chew gum at the same time. Nice, nice, awesome. Yeah, and our second author that we're gonna be exploring is Dr. Albert Moeller. He is the president of Southern Baptist Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky. He's a big thought leader in conservative evangelicalism. And as Josh, as you know, these are some of the circles that, that I run into. And so I can, you know, really experience some of this and, and what he's saying. And so we're going to look at both of them. And our format is going to be as follows. First, we're going to look at the strengths of their argument. Then we're going to look at some of the underlying assumptions that they're making in their work. Third, we're going to look at the implications or consequences of their work. And lastly, we're going to look at maybe some weaknesses and as far as we can read and understand them. So let's jump in. First, we got Dr. Al Mohler, who wrote a piece called Black Lives Matter, Affirm the Sentence, Not the Movement. Now, we have these pieces for you on your screen. If you just look below, you can actually open these up and follow along with us as we read these. So, Josh, I thought this was really interesting because a lot of the discourse that I'm hearing among Christians is so polarizing, right? right? So it's either Black Lives Matter or something like Blue Lives Matter or All Lives Matter. And there's not even, it seems, an interest in meeting in the middle. So one of the things I appreciated from Al Mohler as he starts this is saying, look, look, I get, I get the sentence. This isn't somehow a denial of every other life, it's not that white lives don't matter, right. or it's not that police lives don't matter. Rather, it's saying, hey, can black lives matter too, as well as the other ones, in particular with reference to, to police brutality. Right. And so he gets that, right? And, and I really appreciate that. Um, and so here are some of the strengths. In essence, his thesis is this. We should affirm the sentence, Black Lives Matter, because it's true that people of color are created with value and dignity by God, their image bearers. But we should not affirm the movement because the movement is based on what's called critical race theory or uh, some areas of study that are based on Marxist beliefs. And so the logic goes like this. Black Lives Matter is inextricably tied to Marxism. Marxism is antithetical to Christianity, therefore Black Lives Matter is antithetical to Christianity. That's kind of the way his logic goes. And then what he does in this article is he breaks down the ways that the belief statement for the Black Lives Matter movement has ties or nuances or inklings of Marxist thought. Yeah, that Marxism is like a real big boogeyman in evangelicalism. It is. It is. It's, it's like an allergy, right? Yeah, yeah. So here are some strengths that I saw. One, one thing that like I said, I think he was thoughtful and charitable in understanding and not being willfully ignorant of misrepresenting what people are saying when they hold a sign that says Black Lives Matter. Another strength I, I saw was, listen, it probably is true that identifying people primarily by their economic or social or power structure in society, that probably isn't the best way to identify people. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so th that's cool. We can agree on that. Yes. Now, here are some assumptions that I saw yeah. with, with Moeller that, that I thought were really interesting and, and fascinating to me. First is, um, it seems that his operating method here is that Black Lives Matter is a homogenous or a really singular strand DNA in every single manifestation. Mm. And so that's something I thought was really thought-provoking because like, what do you think? Uh, when yeah. you see BLM, is, 
Is everybody saying the same exact thing every time? No, I mean, you, you have a wide variety of beliefs within the BLM umbrella, right? From people saying, we don't want to defund the police, for example, entirely. Yes, we want yes. to reallocate funds to people making statements as, you know, as far out as saying, you know, ACAB or whatever, like all cops are, you know, bad people, right? And that we have to defund the police entirely and just get rid of the movement. So uh, it's not monolithic by yeah. any stretch of the yeah. imagination. Good, good, good. So, so th that was interesting to me because I, the way I read it, it seems that his assumption of saying we cannot affirm Black Lives Matter as a movement mm -hmm. is, well, that looks exactly the same every time. Right. So I thought that was interesting. The second assumption I thought was really important is that um, any philosophy or way of thinking that isn't explicitly Christian should not be validated in providing truth claims or making statements that we should acknowledge as Christians. So specifically their Marxist influence? Correct. Okay. Yeah. I thought that, again, thought provoking, right? Like, how should we engage that as Christians? Like if, if, um, if I have an atheistic professor of math or if I have um, an atheistic history professor, by virtue of them not being Christian, does that invalidate their claims to truth? I, mean, I think that that's, that's interesting. Well, it seems to kind of, I don't know, ignore Romans 12, right? The idea of being in the world there, but not necessarily mm -hmm. of the world, right? And so you can be in the world and still learn from people who have a different set of belief systems than you, yeah. I would imagine, yeah. right? It seems like we do it fairly often. Right, right, right. And so there's consequences to that, yeah, right? Yeah, for the, sure. The, the, I think the, the implications here, as, as the argument goes, um, in, in the Moeller article, he breaks down the belief systems that are uh, tied to what's called critical race theory or Marxism. And on that basis, he says we cannot affirm that movement. Mm -hmm. So here's some consequences I see from that. As I mentioned, if we invalidate any claim to truth or any knowledge from a source that isn't Christian, what are we left with? It seems to me like a really truncated worldview, yeah. right? Because yeah. the Bible doesn't have a whole lot to say about farming doesn't have a whole lot to say about engineering and doesn't have a whole lot to say about economic systems, mm -hmm. right? And so if, if I cannot count any sources that are not Christian vis-a-vis -vis evangelicalism, it leaves me at a very limited source of knowledge. I don't know, man. Right? The Amish are doing just fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so I think those would be my areas for concern with this. Like, I get it. Like I said, these conservative evangelical circles are the ones that I wait in, yeah. right? Like my colleagues, um, the pastors at my church, I get it. Um, my concern would be, hey, if there's no room for nuance and it's an all or nothing take, then we're not even willing to play ball. Right. And that, that seems like an uncritical position in terms of if, if, I'm, if I'm 20, if, if I'm you know, trying as a young adult to engage and figure out my place in society, that makes it really hard as a Christian to be engaged when all I'm hearing is you can't uh, affirm anything that isn't wholly Christian. Yeah, and the bigger fear that comes along with that is why are you even going to listen? Then, because if if you are of this kind of convinced uh, mentality that you can't learn from people who aren't followers of Jesus, yeah. then you're not going to be able to listen to what people have to say, and then you can't really do that much type of genuine evangelism in terms of relational life living with people who have mm. different sets of beliefs with you. And so, yeah. it not only is it a non-starter; it's kind of like a in a passive condemnation mm. on people who don't follow the same sets of beliefs and kind of core values that you hold. I, th I, I definitely see that, and I, I could see how, how we can get there. And so here we have Moeller, right? Now let's kind of transition to uh, our second author and tell us how does she see it differently? Yeah, so Dr. Kelly Hamrin uh, is, in, in, again, is in a totally different boat. Uh, she is a professor at Liberty University, so she is still technically considered evangelical, right? She still kind of holds on to similar tenets that, that Moeller does. Uh, but she has her PhD specifically in English, and she's looked a lot on 20th century Russian literature, uh, out of which things like Marxism really flow and kind of get picked on, uh, picked right. up later by people in uh, that part of the world. And so uh, we thought it would be important kind of going forward to just give you two very simple definitions of the words Marxism and critical race theory. Uh, and so they're basically this. Marxism is the political and economic theories of Karl Marx, surprise, surprise, uh, and Frederick Engels, uh, later developed by their followers to form the basis for the theory and practice of bum 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 communism right <laughs> uh that dastardly thing that america has uh, sought to fight all through the 20th century uh, and then the second thing critical race theory is a combination of studies in history and law to, that tried to look at how our justice system may be inclined to disfavor people of color
So when we look at some of her premises and conclusions that she draws, it's pretty much what we, what we talked about earlier, right? The idea here is that Black Lives Matter, both as a slogan and a movement, is not simply just an atheistic Marxist movement uh, that is anti-God in the way that it plays out pragmatically, right? We have plenty of Jesus-following black brothers and sisters who are affirming the movement and the sentence, Black Lives Matter. And this is a thing that we have to pay attention to because if we want to be uh, critical thinkers, right, she'll argue, that we have to be able to not throw the baby out with the bathwater and nuance things well. So nuance is really the underlying assumption here that she tries to present throughout the totality uh, of the article that she writes. And I think that these are actually the biggest pros and the strengths of her premises. The nuance, the ability to kind of uh, read in between the lines and see where things are good uh, and leave the bad, right? Kind of eating the chicken and spitting out the bones mm -hmm. as it were. Uh, another thing that she does really well is kind of highlighting that BLM is not just a liberal boogeyman. And, and this is what I'm seeing uh, from our more conservative evangelical friends on that side of the aisle is there's kind of this propensity to uh, inadvertently demonize a lot of the BLM movement because of these two weird things that not a lot of people, I'm willing to bet, know too much about regarding Marxism, uh, Marxism and critical race theory, right? Uh, and then probably my favorite thing that she does in this is she actually points out some good truths in Marxism. Now, this is not because I'm a Marxist. I am not. So if you're watching this, I'm neither a Marxist nor am I a communist, right? Like, I'm just going to say that again. I'm not a Marxist nor am I a communist. But here's what I do believe. All truth belongs to God, right? And so because all truth is God's truth, we're going to come across things uh, in other systems of belief that are indeed true. I don't feel like that's too much of a stretch. And so when you are talking about earlier that we can acknowledge things from people that are outside of the Christian faith, not only does that make us stronger in our belief set, in our systems, in our values, and not only does it give us a better than truncated worldview, it allows us to be able to meet people where they're at and form better, genuine, and more holistic relationships. Uh, so the two things that she says that I think are critically important. The first one is that, and this, these come from Marxism, by the way, uh, power does exist and people do sometimes use it to oppress others. And the second thing is that oppressed people do suffer, and oftentimes their suffering is unjust, okay? Does this sound like any religious figure that you or I follow who might have said this some 2,000-ish years before Karl Marx lived? Yeah, totally interesting. It takes us back to the New Testament. Yeah, right? right? And then this... I know you're an Old Testament guy, but there's, <laughs> there's still some value in the New Testament as a oh, whole. Oh, definitely, definitely. <laughs> and so, so that's, that's really interesting, right? Because the... The posture initially of the conversation isn't necessarily, do I have to convince you of my fundamental beliefs or do I have to forfeit right. my fundamental beliefs? Right. It seems rather I'm willing to hear the specific issues that are going on and how to act accordingly towards them. And I think that's where the crux of the, the disagreement is. Yes, right? Yes, 100%. Like, to what degree is racism actually plaguing our society and to what degree should we do anything about it? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think she's really kind of pushing here some really kind of interesting call to actions. Yeah, and, and what I think uh, is important about her article that I think Moeller's article misses, really, is the statement and the conversation of the individual versus the collective. Yes. Uh, now, I'm not going to speak for all white people here, uh, but... I'll speak for a lot of us. Uh, as white people, we have a propensity to think about the individual, right? Because everything out of the Enlightenment and which, from which modernity sprang and now kind of post-modernity in and of itself, there, there's such an emphasis on the individual inalienable rights that we all have, right? Like these negative rights that we all have independent of government that God has given us and the individual is the smallest minority that we need to protect. And all of those things are good. I affirm all of this, those things and they're all true. But where we kind of get tripped up sometimes is that when we want to have this conversation as white people about racism, we tend to look for these isolated incidents and events. And when we see less and less of them, right, we have a propensity to say, well, then systemic racism is not a problem because there's not these events mm -hmm. or these individual events that are occurring don't add up to an entire system, right? And so because racism tends to be a little bit more benign now in our systemic issues that we have, uh, and it's not like this outright, hey, black people can't vote or whatever, right? It's a little bit harder to find at times mm -hmm. uh, if you don't know how to look for it. We run into this trap that I think Moeller runs into, but uh, Hammer does a great job of pointing out, is that yes, you know, the solution to racism is to help people change their hearts, and those are good things, and blah, blah, blah. But racism as a sin problem in the heart is a great thought, but it's an incomplete extrapolation of the thought. And I think this is her biggest strength that she brings to this article, is because when those things are not fully extrapolated to their logical conclusion, we miss out on the very real reality that people with that sin of racism in their heart 
become people who help build systems that continue to foster that iniquity towards people, right? And, and this is the biggest thing that we have to remember as you know, white people, particularly moving into this dialogue, is just like, yeah, there are systemic issues that we may not be aware of because we are tuned to think so hard to the level of the individual. And I think Hamron does a great job of calling us out of that individual lens hmm. uh, to look further at the collective one. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That, that she definitely has some thought-provoking thoughts there. Do you, do you also see this as kind of a difference in perspective as to what the mission and the calling of the church out in society is? Specifically, and, and like I said, I can speak to this for my context, a more fundamentalist context is going to be more prone to separate and say we need to save souls, not uh, stomachs. Yeah. Right? And so do you, do you see that kind of as an operating kind of under the current assumption here of what the calling of the church is? Yeah, and, and here's, here's my issue with that, right? And what I tend to see from our brothers and sisters who are on that side of like the souls versus stomach thing I don't know how you can parse those things out. And I think Hamron kind of makes this point, like Jesus engaged with everybody right where they were all the time, right? When we look at the two feeding stories, particularly in Mark, right? In Mark 6 and in Mark 8, Jesus both feeds them, right? He nourishes their bodies physically. Yeah. And then he also nourishes their spirits with teaching there. So it, I don't understand how we kind of get into this either or dichotomy. It always feels like it's supposed to be a both and. Right. Because people can't hear you, hear what you have to say, if they can't hear you over their stomach. Right. And people are going to be far more willing mm -hmm. to listen to you when their bellies are full. Definitely. So I think it's just this important understanding that she brings to the surface uh, of how these conversations are longer. Right. Yeah. It's just longer than, a, you know, protesting for like a week and a half and being done with it. Right. Uh, these are generational conversations. These are huge issues that we need to really go after. Definitely. Definitely. And I think where I see the pushback there from Moeller, uh, who's, again, representative of a more conservative evangelical perspective is, I don't want to feel like I have to forfeit the gospel right. for this sense of justice, right? Mm -hmm. And I think what, what Hammerin is really saying is, no, 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 you don't give up your presuppositions about human soul and the human condition that yeah. can ultimately only be transformed by the gospel and the grace of, of Jesus Christ. Yeah. At the same time, that takes a body and a form and a shape and an action that compels us towards, you know, forth towards these issues. And so that, that's really interesting to see both of them kind of diverge on that. Mm -hmm. And we could probably see and different denominations or, yeah, yeah, or yeah. traditions come to mind yeah, for uh, sure. that hold these, these thoughts here. Yeah, well, and Dr. Hammerin actually also does that. She takes that first step by talking about how she only affirms traditional male and female marriage. And she comes under heavy fire in her article, right? right. Like all of the comments there uh, that are underneath it. Like the, a lot of the critiques that she takes is the, her view of, on sexuality and not even about what the main topic of her, you know, of her point was. Yeah. Kind of showing that the gospel is not about giving up your presuppositions, mm. but it's about realizing that the gospel is wider, right. most likely, than the presuppositions that we tend to think we That's might good. hold. What about on the other side? What, what, if, what if somebody came to us and said, hey, if you're not affirming some of these views, whether it's of sexuality or of social restoration, or whatever that may be, you're either with us or you're against us. Yeah. Do you feel like that challenge goes to the other side as well? Yeah, and I, I do think that that's where her article kind of has a propensity for weakness, right? Because it doesn't really talk about that. But she doesn't, I don't know that she's concerned with that reality, mm. right? Because it may be that we need to get to this Fund, pass this fundamental non-starter right. first before we worry about being kind of picked on Correct. for having these kind of beliefs that we do or don't have as, as people. Uh, and, and so uh, you will always, there will always be an inevitable divergence from you in the world, right? And that's what it means to be in and not of mm -hmm. in Romans 12, 1 and 2. And so I think what she's talking about is like, hey, we probably need to spend a little bit more time focusing on the in part before we even worry about having that conversation of feeling like we are of, as it were. Yeah. Good, good stuff, man. So there you have it, guys. Here is our primer to Christianity and how to engage, if at all, Black Lives Matter from the perspective of these two authors. What do you think? Where are you at? How might this challenge you to think a little deeper about tough topics out there? What are some topics that you think are really hard that we should talk about, possibly divisive topics like this one? Leave us a comment below with some suggestions. We'll see you guys next time.